Chapter 11, Peter, what did he know and when? Unfortunately, a wide array of teachings is held, even among Bible-believing Christians, concerning the application of Peter's epistles to the church age. One of the positions espoused among some dispensationalists is that Peter's writings are applicable primarily to quote-unquote tribulation saints and not to the church. If such were the case, one would expect to find Peter offering some instructions on how to survive the most dreadful period upon the earth ever known to man. Yet no such advice exists. Something you need to know in footnote number one, the proof that Cephas is Simon Peter is veiled to some without cross-referencing the scripture. Notice that Simon is Simon Peter, who Jesus named Cephas. John 1 verse 40. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation of stone. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, follow me. Again, John chapter 1 verse 40 through 43 shows that Simon Peter is in fact Cephas. This is important when reading 1 Corinthians. When reading Peter's epistles, one finds no reference to the beast, false prophet, mark of the beast, the 144,000, the two witnesses, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, or the seven vials. In fact, Peter fails to mention Daniel's 70th week, save his reference to the day of the Lord, 2 Peter 3.10. Before thinking Peter's mentioning this future period is so significant, consider that the Apostle Paul also spoke of the day of the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 5.2. In the end, it is impossible for any Bible believer to miss the correlation between what Peter and Paul wrote to the church. In fact, Paul wrote to the Corinthian believers that all things are yours and included himself and Cephas by name. Again, Cephas is Simon Peter. 1 Corinthians 3.21 Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Paulus or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. All are yours and ye are Christ and Christ is God's. Some Bible teachers attempt to force Peter's writings into the future time because of passages that teach that men can fall away from the truth of the gospel. See 2 Peter 2, 20 through 22 and 2 Peter 3, 14 through 17. While these same perceptions arise in Paul's epistles, those concerns are quickly dismissed because assigning Paul's epistles to a future age proves quite problematic. People assume that Peter taught that men were saved but could lose their salvation. This type of teaching should concern every Christian. Most Christians have found themselves vulnerable to times of lesser fellowship with the Lord. However, God assures believers that his chastening hand is designed for corrective actions. Hebrews 12, 6. The key concerning the difficult passages from Peter's epistles is realizing that those who turn are turning not from their salvation, but from the knowledge of salvation. John's first epistle warned regarding these people that were never saved. They went out from among us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. 1 John 2.19 Obviously, these men returned to their old ways because they were never true believers. The Jewish epistles conveyed this truth repeatedly. Peter simply points out that dogs are dogs and pigs are pigs. They do not become sheep no matter how cleaned up. 2 Peter 2.20 For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Notice the conclusion. These men were as dogs who returned to their own vomit, or as sows, that is, pigs, who returned to the mire, the pig pen. 
They were washed on the outside, but never washed in the soul-cleansing blood, Revelation 1.5. God's people were never likened to dogs or pigs, only sheep. These men changed their crowd and changed their behavior, but remained unchanged in nature. They escaped the pollutions of the world by learning the ways of Christ. They knew the way of righteousness as a set of facts, but did not know God in their hearts. And when they returned to the world, their latter end was worse than the beginning. Why? It had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to blatantly reject what they knew to be true. Another passage from 2 Peter, that is 2 Peter 3, 14 through 17, has caused some difficulty for the brethren, but it too does not contradict the truth. In a basic sense, Peter urged his audience to make sure of their salvation. Paul too taught in the same manner when he admonished the Corinthians to examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not that your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Reprobates were rejected from salvation. See Jeremiah 6.30, because they never truly received the truth. They are reprobate concerning the faith, 2 Timothy 3.8, and are led away with the error of the wicked, 2 Peter 3.17. Peter admonished his audience to be diligent, 2 Peter 3.14, and to beware, 2 Peter 3.17, lest they find themselves in that number. Peter did not teach the loss of salvation and had much in common in his doctrine and teaching with that of the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Stewards of the Manifold Grace of God Many believers associate the grace of God almost exclusively to Paul's ministry. In fact, a good number of Bible-believing dispensationalists have unfortunately identified the church age as the age of grace and assigned this period almost exclusively to the Apostle Paul. This is dangerous and unwise since grace did not start or end with Paul's ministry. However, the phrase, grace of God, is found 24 times in Scripture, with 20 instances either in the writings of or through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. While not ignoring the emphasis of Paul's ministry, we should also ensure that we do not forget that in Peter's epistle he uses the word grace ten times and the word gracious another time. In fact, two of the references to the grace of God are found in Peter's epistles, one of which expresses that believers are stewards of the manifold grace of God, ministering the gift of grace they receive to others. 1 Peter 4.10 As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If that truth were not Pauline enough, consider that the Apostle Peter also exhorted and testified that this is the true grace of God, wherein ye stand, 1 Peter 5.12. In other words, the manifold grace of God, which he and others had ministered, was the true grace of God, wherein they stood. The Bible student recognizes the familiarity of this terminology. After all, Paul spoke of Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, Romans 5, 2. Yet some would continue to espouse that Peter and Paul's writings are irreconcilable. They are simply blinded by their man-made system of study, saved by grace through faith and the gospel. This subject of the grace of God in Peter's epistles can be even further developed. Consider the first chapter of Peter's first epistle. When addressing his audience, Peter acknowledged that they had been begotten by the resurrection of Jesus Christ and kept by the power of God and not through their own works. In fact, their salvation was so sure that they were begotten to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and it fadeth not away reserved in heaven for them. Imagine equating this eternal security to a works-based salvation. 1 Peter 1, three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to this abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time." Peter addressed an audience saved by the grace of God based upon faith in the power of the resurrection of Christ. Additionally, these believers addressed in Peter's epistles had assurance that an inheritance was reserved for them in heaven. Only a man blinded by his own biases could suggest that Peter's audience was hoping to be saved by faith plus some form of works. 
Anyone that is supposedly saved by faith and works can never have any assurance of salvation. But Peter's audience was kept by the power of God and assured of an inheritance reserved for them. No Bible believer would ever teach that this differs from the same eternal security found in Paul's writings. Page 179 has a chart titled, Reconciling Peter and Paul. Unfortunately, due to the preconceived biases, some Bible teachers have forced a false interpretation on the word salvation in 1 Peter 1.5. According to the context, this salvation or deliverance would be revealed in the last time. These saints addressed by Peter were already begotten, but were awaiting the revelation of their physical salvation. This is not some sort of progressive salvation, but rather testifies of the redemption of the body, Romans 8.23. In other words, Peter's audience was saved and secured, but awaiting a salvation of the body which was near than when they had believed, Romans 13.11, the appearing of Jesus Christ. Additionally, Peter was obviously aware of truths taught by Paul. Peter's familiarity with Paul's teachings likely started as early as Acts 9.27, but certainly became further developed by Acts chapter 15. At the time of the writing of Peter's epistles, he was also familiar with Paul's epistle, 2 Peter 3, verses 15 and 16. Therefore, one would expect that Peter would express his familiarity with the teaching concerning the blessed hope, also known as the rapture of the church. Both apostles referred to it as the appearing of Jesus Christ. In fact, just a few verses after referring to the future salvation of the body, Peter identified that event as the consummation of the saints' trial of faith. 1 Peter 1, seven that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Peter wrote about Christ appearing at the rapture, which was also a common theme in Paul's teachings and writings. The scripture contains six instances of the word appearing. In addition to the one occurrence Peter mentions above, the other five are in Paul's epistles and plainly point to the church's departure at the rapture. 1 Timothy 6.14 That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 1.10 But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death, and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. 2 Timothy 4.1 I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Verse 8 Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. On page 180, the chart is titled, Peter and Paul, Christ Appearing. Titus 2.13 is another verse, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter certainly gave insights concerning the second advent, as did Paul, but also clearly testified of the church's hope of Christ's return prior to Daniel's 70th week. This only makes sense if Peter was writing, to people who were expecting the Savior's appearing but needed to understand the doctrinal distinctions between the blessed hope and the second advent. Salvation by grace through faith. The truths explored thus far should sufficiently persuade any true Bible student of the problems associated with assuming Peter's epistles are inapplicable to the church and support a salvation based upon faith plus works. Yet there is so much more that should prove quite problematic for any such false teachings. Peter specified that salvation was a gift of God's grace obtained by faith. Peter stated that his audience received the salvation of their souls by faith. This salvation was through grace and was revealed because of preaching the gospel to them. 1 Peter 1.9 Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you, with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into." The problems associated with forcing the application of Peter's epistles into a future period, 
that is Daniel's 70th week, requires some very strange and contradictory assumptions. If this false teaching is taken to its logical conclusion based upon how the hyper-dispensationalist teaches it, this would mean the first century recipients of Peter's epistles would have had to assume that the material was inapplicable to them during the church age. They would have further assumed that it was written to a future audience who are to be saved by faith and works. This supposed faith and works salvation would be based upon a different gospel than the one defined in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. They would also have to discount Peter's mentioning of the indwelling of the Holy Ghost if the indwelling during the church age ends at the rapture. These are just a few of the issues with this one line of thinking that create confusion. Yet Peter's audience would have certainly considered the letter written to them as applicable to them. To deny this is to deny the literal use of historical places such as Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia in 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, and historical peoples such as Silvanus, 1 Peter 5.12, and Marcus, 1 Peter 5.13, and a historical church at Babylon, 1 Peter 5.13. Although there were certainly things contained in that letter applicable to the future, it was a historical audience who would have been familiar with these places and people. It was that historical audience who had had the gospel preached to them, and that gospel was the gospel of the grace of God. Had this been a different gospel, it would have violated Galatians 1, verses 8 and 9. Yet those who choose to be blinded by Bible study formulas will remain in darkness because of an unwillingness to be corrected by the book, Blood Redeemed. Not only did Peter agree with and confirm Paul's teaching concerning the blessed hope for the church-age saints, but he clearly taught salvation by grace through faith accessible only through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Specifically, Peter stated that the audience he addressed was redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. 1 Peter 1.18 for as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Paul stated this same truth in Titus 2.14. Therefore, Peter and Paul agreed that redemption was purchased by the precious blood of Christ shed upon the cross of Calvary. Because of Christ's redemption, these believers were looking for the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. Surely, Peter's first century audience was part of the body of Christ and saved just like every believer over the last two millennia. In fact, Peter's audience had purified souls and pure hearts. The chart on page 183 is titled, Peter, Redeemed by the Blood. Here's the verse, 1 Peter 1.22, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Unfortunately, those with a hyper-dispensationalist mindset latch on to one word to create a whole system of false teaching. They read the word obeying and robotically imagine this means works, although Paul wrote similar truths when he spoke of obeying the gospel, Romans 10.16. Believers should ensure that they never assume biblical definitions without consulting the scripture. Every truth must be studied in context. Unfortunately, many Bible teachers have distorted the meaning of obey by limiting obedience solely to following a set of commands. Although obedience certainly does involve following the rules, the Bible indicates a much broader application. For instance, 2 Kings 18.12 sheds light on obedience and the depth of its meaning. According to that passage, Israel would not hear them, the commandments of God, nor do them. With this context, it is easy to understand that the Bible defines disobedience as the refusal to hear and do the commandments of the Lord. Other similar passages teach this same truth, 1 Samuel 15.22, Proverbs 5.13, Jeremiah 17.23. In other words, obedience is twofold. First, the individual must have an attentive ear, and second, he must act by faith to do what he now knows to do. Consider that Paul spoke of those who obeyed from the heart and were made free from sin, Romans 6, 17 and 18. Surely no Bible-believing Christian suggests that Paul was teaching a works-based salvation because he used the same terminology as Peter. Additional clarity comes 
when we consider that Peter wrote about those who obey not the gospel of God, 1 Peter 4.17, and thus remain lost. This context is further clarified when Peter contrasts belief versus disobedience in the second chapter of his first epistle. 1 Peter 2.7, Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Quite simply, those who are disobedient refuse to believe by faith. Everyone must obey by hearing the gospel, by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Despite the efforts by some to force a private interpretation upon the scripture, obeying the truth through the Spirit is not a form of work salvation. It is a doctrine clearly taught by both Paul and Peter and is applicable to Jew and Gentile alike. Rejection of truth always gets compounded by the doctrinal problems it creates. Those who assume a primary tribulational application of Peter's epistles feel compelled to limit being born again to the nation of Israel. Yet the phrase born again simply contrasts the spiritual rebirth to the physical birth, born of water of the flesh, John 3, 5, and 6. 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. While it is true that Paul did not incorporate the phrase born again, he certainly taught that all Christians are born again when they become babes. 1 Peter 2.2, 2, 1 Corinthians 3.1. He further indicated that the new birth produced the new man within the believer. Colossians 3.10. Although he did not use the same phraseology, he was certainly speaking of being born again when he spoke of regeneration, Titus 3.5. To be born again means to be regenerated, and this happens when the believer becomes a new creature in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5.17 and Galatians 6.15. The first birth for everyone is a physical birth, and the second birth for a Christian is a spiritual birth, dead to sin. Any man who chooses to read the Bible with preconceived biases is forced to study the Bible through man-made blinders. As a result, he sees whatever he wants to see in the Bible and no more. Only such an ill-conceived practice would lead someone to miss the similarities between the writings of Peter and the writings of Paul. Even a cursory reading and understanding of Peter's epistles shows that they do not contradict Paul's writings. This is true even down to the minutest details. For example, both Peter and his target audience were dead to sins because they were spiritually healed by the blood, the stripes, of the great shepherd. 1 Peter 2.24 who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live under righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. This truth parallels Paul in two aspects. First, it shows that salvation was not a process, but something already obtained and secured in the lives of both Peter and his audience. This is very much similar to the teachings of Paul. Second, the concept of being dead to sins while still battling sin was expressed by Paul concerning himself and his target audience. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Romans 6, 2. Do not miss that. Only the redeemed are dead to sin or sins. Peter and Paul address those who were now dead to sin, like precious faith. Interestingly, Peter addressed his second epistle to the same audience as his first epistle. Notice that Peter said that they had obtained like precious faith with us. 2 Peter 1.1 1, 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Consider the implications of what Peter wrote in his epistles. Peter said the faith obtained by his audience was like the faith that he and his company had obtained. Furthermore, this obtained faith was accomplished through the righteousness of God and not the works of man. As such, Peter's admonition clearly matched Paul's address to those who had been saved by grace through faith. Peter's mention of like precious faith is the faith of Jesus Christ mentioned by Paul and experienced by all those reconciled to God by being made the righteousness of God. Romans 3.21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. 2 Corinthians 5.20, 
Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteous of God in him. The chart on page 186 is titled, Peter, the Righteousness of God. If these truths are insufficient, Peter concluded his two epistles by emphasizing that he and Paul wrote to the same recipients, both accounting that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, 2 Peter 3, 15-17. Why would God lead Peter to express his association to Paul if their messages contradicted one another? The direct association is emphasized because their writings were not contradictory but complementary. Once people compare the writings of Peter and Paul, those who continue to teach that Peter's message contradicts Paul's writings are simply perpetrating an error to support a man-made system of Bible teaching. That is the end of chapter 11.